Dave, good afternoon, sir. How are you doing? You well? I'm very well. Yeah, it's lovely to be here and to talk to you. Yeah. I'm an even, even better to have you. Really appreciate your time. You're going to be taking part in South Bank Centre's Meltdown Festival, the longest running artist curated festival in the world, in partnership, I'm told, with Brilliant Corners. Um, you're going to be joined with some luminaries and friends on June the 14th at the Queen Elizabeth Hall. Tell me more, sir. Yeah, it's really exciting. It was um, uh, Grace Jones was going to curate Meltdown. She was invited to curate it a couple of years ago and obviously the pandemic hit. So everything kind of got postponed and was up in the air. So I think the energy now that, um, you know, everything's firmed up is just there's a, there's a lot of excitement. And I'm really, really looking forward to the opportunity to... Um, well, to, to celebrate Grace, really. So the concept of the show is um, we're going to be interpreting some of her repertoire. I've assembled um, a band of some of my favourite musicians in this country, um, most of whom I have really, really long-standing relationships with. And we're going to be performing our iterations of her music. But we also wanted to um, spotlight the music of Wally Badaru, um, who... Uh, I feel um, is such an, a, an, a, an artist who's made such an amazing contribution to recorded music, basically, and was a key part of uh, the iconic Grace Jones, Compass Point, All Stars sound. And uh, he released an album, which is a bit of a cult classic called Echoes. And um, I've been a fan of that record for a long time. And what we thought would be really nice to do is kind of... Um, try to demonstrate the links between that music and Grace's music. So we're going to be interpreting music from Grace's catalogue and some of the music from from uh, from that Echoes record of Wally's. Um, and yeah, I just I just can't wait. We're going to have an absolute ball and I really hope um, lots of people can make it down. If the smile on your face is anything to go by, you're really looking forward to this, aren't you? I could tell. Yeah, so much. It's like that, that music which is so deep into my DNA. Um, so to have the opportunity just to celebrate, um, I, I love to celebrate people's contributions and to and to honour those contributions and show how they've inspired me. And performance is such a wonderful context to do that in. And yeah, it just feels um, like a convergence of a lot of really, really positive things. So yeah, I'm, t I'm totally hyped for it. It's going to be a good one. Yeah. We're going we're gonna to get into it a little bit more, but you this is not your first rodeo in terms of working with Grace, right? Talk about the experiences that you've had with her prior to this this festival yeah grace and i met like i guess over a decade ago now um and you know it's probably important to contextualize it in terms of how important she is to me as an artist um one of my kind of earliest memories of connecting with music was with her basically um so i'm the youngest of 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 eight and all my older siblings were into music and most of them were into grace and I, I remember you know as a child growing up in Vienna um my sisters getting ready to go out you know um to have a good time and they would they would sort of dress like they'd sort of model themselves on grace and listen to her records and I remember holding um a copy of Slave to the Rhythm in my hands you know aged about seven maybe and looking at this artwork and you know um Many of you will know that iconic Jean-Paul Goud image. It's her face is kind of stretched out. And um, I was too young to understand how, how that could be technically achieved, but I knew that it wasn't real. Um, but it was so striking and so beautiful to me and also like terrifying at the same time. And I remember looking at it and feeling like the image was actually screaming at me to be myself that was the energy that I was getting from it and at that time in my life you know growing up um you know in a in a place where people didn't look like me um and where uh I suppose when I looked to the to the mainstream and the media there was not really much representation of anyone with like my complexion doing excellent things or being given that platform it was incredibly liberating to see this person um, so fully expressing themselves in such an unapologetic and complex way. And that really, you know, I'm, I guess I may be able to articulate that a bit better at this stage in my life, but I remember that feeling very, very clearly. I just felt like, oh, okay, so there is a space for me in the world and I don't have to um, necessarily conform to what I'm seeing around me, which I couldn't conform to anyway, because I was different from those people. So um, I'm, 
eternally grateful to her and her expression and um, how imaginative it is and how liberated it is and how complex it is in terms of all the cultural threads that it, it draws together. Um, so if you imagine that, you know, Grace, yeah, she's, she's a hero of mine, um, as you can probably tell. So when the opportunity came, you know, rose to, to work with her, it was, it was more than a dream come true. And um, the way that came about was through um, a friend of mine, Ivor Guest, who is Grace's producer. And I'd met Ivor and, and worked on him with a few on a few records, and we'd become really good friends. And um, you know, he would talk to me about working with Grace and tell me all the stories, and I was just like hanging on his every word. And then one day he said, "You know, I've started to conceptualize the new record." <coughs> Excuse me. And um, I would, you know, I'd love you to be involved if that's something you'd like to do. Mm. I fell out of my chair <coughs> and immediately um, um, I remember sort of, I remember I went upstairs in the house we were in and I immediately started imagining songs for Grace. Excuse me, I'm just going to take a swig of water. You know, I started imagining writing for this iconic voice, basically, and um, yeah, and it didn't. It it seemed like maybe I don't know. It, it just seems almost impossible that that could come about. And fast forward um, a few months later, um, Ivor arranged for Grace and um, another dear friend of mine and mentor and brilliant musician, Eska, to. To, to meet Grace properly. And I had met her once before in quite an unusual context at, at Elton John's house, <laughs> if you if you'd believe it or not, at his um, white tie and tiara party. But that was just like a, a very brief hello. And um, this was a much more intimate situation where we were able to sort of get to know each other and see if there was any scope for for working together. And, and that, that evening... Um, remains will always remain a very very memorable moment in my life because it was a chance to connect with her and she she opened her home to us and she spoke very candidly about about many things about her creative process about the importance of trust um and uh it was also a chance for me to tell her kind of what what she meant to me and and um how she touched my life and inspired me and kind of set me on the path that I was, you know, that I'm on. Um, so that was, that was the beginning of a relationship. And, it, you know, that it was just so wonderful to have the space to actually connect with her in that way. And to know that whatever lay ahead was, there was going to be a commitment to authenticity. And it was so striking to me that, you know, at that stage in her life in her career, um, you know, I could see it in her eyes how how much it meant to her to to express herself creatively in the fullest way possible. That spark and that vitality was was burning as bright as it ever was. And again, that's also something that um, I draw a great deal of inspiration from. You know, in a culture where we sort of completely fetishize youth and feel like people don't have anything to give beyond the age of 30. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's really amazing to see what, to be in the atmosphere of a person who has given their lives over to um, a creative process that is completely their own and how energizing and, and vitalizing that is. And um, yeah, she she's, was replete with that energy. And from that point onwards, we just set about chipping away at this um, at this record. And you know, we'd we'd convene at various points. You know, maybe sometimes months would pass. You know, she'd she'd be performing, or she'd be on the other side of the world, and then we'd kind of get back together and and um, and work on material. And and there, you know, along that journey, there were there were many really special moments. But perhaps one of the most special ones was spending um, time with her in Jamaica. Um, where the music, um, I don't know, I can't think of many times where an environment has really helped me make sense of what, what music actually is, you know, and her music really, um, I felt like I gained a deeper understanding by actually being on that soil and creating with her. And that, again, was a, another really, really magical experience. 
Um, and I guess, I don't know, there's, there's so much to say, but one of... You, one yeah, of, I, I can well imagine. You wouldn't be the first <laughs> to be impacted by that island in that way. It has, there's a magic oh, about right. it. And yeah, I yeah, guess yeah. when there's a genuine creativity, creativity just bubbling, um, it's, a, it's the perfect environment to bring out some magic. It sounds like, uh, and this is, this is one of these, I don't want to say rare, but one of these uh, times when meeting your hero wasn't an actual disappointment <laughs> you know they, they say never you should never meet your heroes right but it sounds like yeah, uh, yours was actually a spur for you absolutely yeah i think i've been very lucky in that regard i've met a few of my heroes and worked with a few of my heroes and it's always been um almost always been like a, a very very rewarding uh process and i think i think in a way that's the key word it's it's you know if you're if you're allowed to actually have a process with a person like that, if you're if you're invited into that that inner sanctum and a trust is built, then it's really hard for it not to be fulfilling. So I'm just so grateful that she was prepared to do that because you know she could have easily you know chosen not to do that. So so I feel very very privileged to you know to have been invited and onto into that journey in, in such an intimate way. And and yeah, that's it's really changed my life that experience for sure. Adele, Amy Winehouse, Quabs, Yoko Ono, I could go on and on and on. You just mentioned, you know, sitting down with Elton John. Um, <laughs> it's been it's been a it's been a pretty steep gradient for you, hasn't it? It's been a it's been a, a, a an upward trajectory that you know a kite might be envious of, you know. Um, <laughs> I, I say that because in 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 all respect. Because I, I wonder at this point in your career, Dave, like what's what's keeping you motivated? You know, what's what's keeping you getting through every day, every week, every year, every month, every year, making it look better. Um, what what keeps you what keeps you ticking? Such a such a deep question, and I, I think that um, it's such an important question to ask. And you know, when I started making music, when I left university and I, I was already playing a lot of music, but I remember coming back to London from Scotland where I, I did a degree in French and politics in Edinburgh and came back and I was like, okay, right, here we go. And, you know, I guess it was the beginning of me trying to come to terms with what it means to sustain a creative life. And um, I, I noticed that I was, um, the way things seemed to play out was Essentially, I was waiting for the phone to ring, you know, and the, and sometimes it would ring a lot, and then it would stop ringing, you know. <laughs> and I thought, is this what my, you know, is this what my life is going to be? Just, you know, at the behest of all these external um, dynamics that I have no control over, you know. And and my instinct, even at, you know, at that at that age where I was probably, um, you know, probably had the kind of blind courage of youth, I I still was there was this question mark where I just thought. I'm not sure if I can live like <laughs> I'm not sure if I can live like this. So, so I started to ask myself questions, which I which I continue to ask myself on an almost daily basis. You know, I, I realized that it it would be very it would be essential for me to define what fulfillment was for myself. You know what and and for me that was about being in contact with my intention. And so I asked myself, you know let's take money out of the equation because I think that that often drives people in really strange ways, you know, and obviously there's a, there's an element of necessity, but what happens if you take money out of the equation? And I would ask myself, what would I be doing if, if money was of no concern? And then I would ask myself, what would I be doing if no one was looking, you know, if no one was paying heed and I, that, removing those elements um really stripped everything away and put me in touch with what really matters to me um and what i was left with was a sense that the, the two things that really matter to me are relationship and process basically and in a way that's all in in my view that's all there is you know that's all there is that really means anything and i feel that if if I can nurture the quality of my relationships and if I can sustain a process of growth, I'm really happy. So all the other details um, can, I just have to work them out around that. And, you know, at the heart of that, I think what drives processes is inspiration and curiosity. And I think one of the great privileges of, of, of um, 
my life as I see it is that each day um, the challenge is to stay connected to my inspiration. And um, I see it all around me. I see it in people in all spheres of life. Um, the people who have that atmosphere about them. Um, one of my heroes, is, his name is Don Abaka. He's my hairdresser. And he's, um, he's a man in his 60s and he has the vitality of like a, of a 25 year old. And it's because he's been doing what he loves for his whole life. And he's so connected to what inspires him. Um, and that's being performed and acted out every day through his life. And, and, and there's a magnetism to him as a result of that. And you can, you can feel his, his sense of fulfillment and vitality. And, um, you know, when I look to my elders, those are the guys that I'm looking to, the men and women who, who have, um, who have connected to, to the source and who are living through in that slipstream. And it, and it pours out of them, it pours out of their skin and out of their spirit and out of their eyes and, and whatever they touch is, is infused with that. And so that's been my example. And I just, I feel very lucky to have had that example in my life. And I, I had it with my parents and, um, and in, in many of the people who sort of passed through and, and also in many of my friendships. And so um, that never goes away. And, and it amazes me that it never goes away because I think we have, you know, we have this idea of, of the impermanence of things and the transitory nature of things. But I think meaning is lasting and I find meaning in relationship and process. And, um, and you know, I, I say with confidence that I, that, will, that will go on, like whatever life throws at me. And, you know, sometimes I think about what, what would happen if I, if I couldn't make music for some reason. But I, I know that what I'm talking about transcends you know, craft or disciplines or whatever. It's a, it's a very, very fundamental state. And I would argue that it's, it's a naturally occurring state because when I look at my five-year-old son, he has that energy. You know, I often look at children and they just have that energy about them. So I, I kind of, my instinct says, actually the thing that I'm using all these tools to try and access, you know, music, the, the, the majestic language of music, it's just about bringing me back to a state that is natural. It's like the way things are actually meant to be. And, you know, there are, there's no better example of that than my beautiful five-year-old. I just look at him every day and I look at how he interacts with the world and how in the moment he is and how playful he is and how his curiosity is what leads to his development and how full of love he is. And I'm like, oh, surely that's the natural order of things. And that's the place where I want to exist. And really, that's what all this stuff is about for me. That's what, you know, that's what making music with people, it's what performing is about, it's what learning my craft is about. It's driven by a curiosity and a desire to be connected to inspiration and to be in process. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a well that is bottomless, you know, and I don't think that's a reflection on me it's just how it is. I just think that's how the universe is. And, you know, if you're prepared to, to look in that direction, I think, um, or like get into, you know, get into that slipstream, I think it, it carries you from, from your, you know, first breath to your last breath, you know. Yeah. I really appreciate your candor and, and insight. Um, I ask that question quite often mm. and I don't think anybody's answered it in this succinct and as rounded a way as, as you have so i appreciate you sharing that okay. um the the notion of, of living your truth right if i can yeah. surmise um recognition is coming various different guises i guess the fact that people listen to you turn up to listen to you is the ultimate true recognition um but we know that's underpinned by how you're marketed how it's pushed out there etc sure. etc et I wonder, looking at your journey in terms of the awards that have, I guess, accelerated that process, um, the Mercury, first time around as part of the Invisible, mm. and the nod from them again in 2010 as a producer, um, working with Jesse Wiry and co-writer. Co co um, what did that mean at the time? When you reflect on it, what does it mean? And, and do you harbour recognition in that guys in that way that shape or form moving forward is there anything that you'd like to win 
as it were? Um, yeah, it's such an interesting question. I, I think people become, you know, understandably quite confused about this stuff, you know, sort of seeking validation and affirmation. And I don't know, again, I kind of, I trace back to, you know, quite early on in this journey for me, you know, and I think it has a lot to do with the examples that, that were set before me, um, you know, in my family and my parents, you know, through faith, through um, community. Uh, the notion of sort of um, being driven by a sort of narcissistic, egotistical need for attention, it just, it spoke to me of insecurity, you know, always, it always felt to me that if that's what drives me, something's amiss. Um, so let's have a look at what that might be, you know. And so I think that way of, of, of contextualizing that question brought me very quickly to a place of um, seeing acknowledgement as, as a wonderful thing, but by no means essential. Um, so really the, the meaning and the fulfillment comes from something deeper than that. You know, and I think I think I was I was I've always been inclined to look at what's going on internally as opposed to externally because I think that the external stuff, a you have no control over it really. I mean, you can try your hardest, and you know, I suppose if people are well resourced and stuff like that, it can be, a, you know, you might be able to have a greater impact. But but really, externals. I think an understanding of of where the boundaries of control and what you have to let go of, where they exist, I think leads to leads to a state of peace, really. It's how we make peace with things. And in a way, I think it's something that, that true performers always embody, because it's like, a, it's it's such a brilliant metaphor for that that dynamic. If you, if I watch a clip of Nina Simone performing, I feel like I'm watching somebody who understands exactly what they're in control of and exactly what they're giving over to the moment. And, and there's no battle in that. It's just, and through that reconciliation, life th flows through that moment and in a way that changes lives. And that's really what I'm interested in. And that's about something bigger than me. And that doesn't that doesn't sort of mean that um, uh, you know there's that's that is also driven by a desire to connect with people, but it's not out of a need for that to be reflected back at me. It's really interesting. Uh, I've I've never really felt um, a need for attention in that way. Um, I do feel that good work is deserving of a platform, and and I. I spot, you know, for, for as much for my friends and contemporaries and all the amazing things that I see happening around me, I, I just always am filled with this desire for, um, for that work to, to reach the people that it, that it needs to reach and to form those connections, because I think that is to the benefit of the whole of humanity. It's not about one person um, profiting or being catapulted or being idolized. It's about it's about humanity emerging and coming up and being in, and culture being enriched. I, I, that's really what I'm interested in. So the idea of like personal acknowledgement um, and being entitled to that is kind of alien to me. It's as strange as walking into a park and looking at a tree and saying, how can I make that tree about me? It's like, you know, I just want to be a part of existence and to enrich existence and, and, um, and to feel like I've I've made a contribution to that conversation, uh, and that that's been good. And you know, however that manifests is fine by me. It's like if that manifests with someone throwing a million quid at me, great. If it manifests with someone throwing an award at me, brilliant. But really, that's not um, you know that's not the uh, the prerequisite. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of how I feel about it. So I'm, I'm not I'm not churlish about it. I'm not like any time it doesn't matter who it is whether it's a child or um one person or a hundred people like showing appreciation for what i what i do i'm humbly encouraged by that but it's not something that i hanker after um but i do i do want to connect with people because i think as i say like i think relationships are invaluable i think it's what we're built for basically yeah you, you've touched on a lot there i mean enrich be enriched essentially right so uh, yeah i get it what about people you'd like to well, who's left dave to work 
<laughs> Who's left? <laughs> you know I mean? Who else would you like to share a stage with, record with? I don't know. To do some, do oh, some. Oh man, there's there's so many, there's so many people. I mean, you know, I just think, um, yeah, the world's amazing, man. It's like talent is everywhere, and there are so many people doing incredible things, and. Um, yeah, I don't know the wish list. I don't know, like uh, there's there's a, there's so many people. I feel like, I mean, I do feel so fortunate to have have worked mm. with, with so many people, and I I have a collaborative nature, and mm. you know, and I love working with emerging artists. I love, I love, yeah, I I love that nascent energy of like, oh my god, this is like, it's just starting. Um, but I also. I also really thrive and off like learning from from my elders and those who've gone before me and forged the path and um, yeah I guess like oh man it was I mean this isn't isn't about me but it's just it was so exciting you know with Kendrick's record um, mm -hmm. dropping recently. Come on, and, come on, talk here. That's a big, it's a big thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Ken, yeah, it's amazing. I, I mean, I love Kendrick, but just uh, my my friend Duval Timothy contributed to that record, and it was just so amazing to see, uh, yeah, to to see that happening. And I know that that had its uh, seeds. I, I don't think you'd mind me saying, and uh, you know, it'd been a, it's a relationship that, had, like most meaningful relationships, are built over over time, and. Um, yeah, it's wonderful um, seeing those connections being made, you know, across the Atlantic. And um, yeah, I think Kendrick's. I, I, I'm, I'm, I think what he's doing is absolutely amazing, and he'd be a fan, just a wonderful person to work with. Um, I love, um, I love Inflow, the producer Inflow. I, you know, I think he is somebody who, you know, I, I celebrate with every breath because I think he's doing wonderful work and I love the fact that he's in his own lane and so prolific and and um just yeah just in enriching the landscape um and uh who else could I mention um I love the the Paul brothers AK Paul and Jay Paul um and you know our paths have sort of crossed gently um I had the 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 privilege of um performing with them both and you know it's one of the only times I've ever performed but yeah I'd love to get in the studio with those guys um I there's remember, a couple there's a couple yeah there's there's a, couple, there's, right? a there's a whole load I, I had yeah. a, I had a time when I was in the states like doing that thing that happens when you have a bit of success and everyone says go to America and meet lots of people and I'd kind of gone to New York um you know with the intention of finding Q-tip uh, he's a real hero of mine and um someone i'd love to work with and it was really funny because I, I wasn't able to to hook up with him but i did find myself sitting in Soho house new york and he walked in but he was like on a date and i was like i can't just go up and like hustle the brother but like, <laughs> no, so so on. No, you did yeah. the right thing i don't know yeah, if yeah it's the right it's the right <laughs> shout right it's the right shout but yeah there's 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 a ton of people man of course it will come i mean that's why we've got to put it out there right that's how things yeah, yeah. Best, you know what I mean? exactly listen exactly. i've got a couple of questions left um i want to bring it back to the markdown festival but i mean you've, you've given some insight into into your preferences and, and what drives you i wonder what you make of the musical landscape the musical landscape in 2022 what do you what are you enamored by what are you you know maybe leaving to one side and, and what about the way that people consume music where are your thoughts on on that yeah so it's a really really interesting time i think um i think that i think we need to be vigilant if we're not careful i think we're gonna lose a lot of really important <laughs> things um about what it is to be human and make music and why music is so valuable to us culturally and so fundamental. You know, in some ways, I was having a conversation, I was performing on the weekend and I was having a conversation with the, the other musician I was performing with and, the, and some of the people who were there, just about the fact that, you know, in the grand scheme of things, this the relationship that we have to music, you know, now where it's, it's a consumer product or like we go and buy tickets to go and watch someone perform it's 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 relatively new you know in the, if you're looking at like the big bang or whatever you believe in you know it's like music music used to serve a, a function 
it, you know, it existed as an expression of community and it had all these different functions within the community. And now it's become something that's commodified and has like such high currency, you know, because it's literally everywhere. But actually, in terms of the remuneration of artists and how artists are sustained, it's like um, there, there, there are enormous discrepancies there. Um, so, yeah, exactly. So I think that's a real problem. I also think that um, uh, there's, there's this interesting dynamic in terms of our relationship to technology, which I think, you know, goes beyond the world of music. It's, it's, it's just where we're at in, you know, the combination of the age of the individual as it seems to persist and um, our, the extent to which we're enthralled to technology. I, you know, I have nothing against technology, but I think that we have, we need to think about what our relationship to technology is. Um, you know, when I look at the advancements in technology over the last, you know, 20 or 30 years, they're, they're absolutely remarkable. And there's an aspect to it, which has democratized lots of, you know, processes in a really positive way. And I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you having done the things that I'd done if, if it wasn't for certain, technological advances that meant that you didn't have to be extremely rich to kind of undertake you know the realization of a creative vision um so i'm really really grateful for that but there's another side to that coin where i feel like it's it <clears throat> our, our relationship to it is is becoming thoughtless and um and very very left-brained and very mechanistic and very explicit and i think we're losing um, what what it is, you know, if we're not careful, um, I don't want to be use such broad brushstrokes, but if we're not careful, we may lose what is so magical about being human. Um, and that's why I guess an event like Meltdown is so important and to have, have it curated by a master performer, a cultural icon, someone who, you know, has seen it all and continues to, kind of blow everyone out of the water as a performer i'm really um i'm just really uh in in favor of of celebrating real performance because in some ways i think that's that's the antidote to this this mechanization and, and relationship to technology where we become uh driven by um uh aspects which I would say are like counterintuitive to like creativity and human expression such as the pursuit of perfection making everything as like perfect and right as possible which actually has got nothing to do with being human in my view um you know having control of every single component of of what's going on rather than learning how to work with the movement of life actually having movement in what what we create as opposed to um, trying to like reverse engineer that vitality because because we have the to these these technological tools that allow us to do that. There are all kinds of layers to to these dynamics, and I think they're they're really really complex. And I think if we don't give them the attention they warrant, they may subsume what actually makes things magical. And so you know, I just think there's everything to play for in that regard. And I think there are people doing wonderful, wonderful things. And, you know, I don't, you know, it's, it's not about a nostalgia for the past. I just want us to have, you know, to actually be empowered as human beings in terms of how we undertake things and to give things the attention and the level of thought that they, that they demand of us rather than like mindlessly finding ourselves in a sort of homogenized landscape that is driven essentially by fear rather than curiosity and and, and exploration. Yeah. All of all of the elements you uh, expressed coming out of your five year old. Literally, I mean, you know, <laughs> they say children of the future. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm just like, yeah, he's 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 one of the um, he's such a an amazing example to me of, of what it's actually all about. And in a way, like it's such a great litmus test because it's like, if it doesn't really tally with him, I know something's up and he's, <laughs> it's really interesting. Like seeing how he listens to music. Like he often comes into my studio where I'm sitting now. And he'll listen to things that I'm working on. And when it's right, I, I can tell it 
in his body um, and how he engages with it. And I feel like these are all instincts that are like hardwired in. They're natural. They're completely natural. And I think it. I think um, we do ourselves a great service to just check in with that and make sure that we're aligning with that and that we haven't abstracted from that that source to such a degree that it's just become something totally different, you know. And I think the tools that are at our disposal and the platforms and the new ways of consuming music, you know, it just all needs to be recontextualized in actually what it is to be human, which is really complicated and exciting and far reaching, you know. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of that's kind of how I feel about the current state of affairs. You kind of answered my last question as well, so I, won't, I don't need to go there, which was which was about you know the value in artist curated festivals. Um, Dave, it's been a real pleasure to sit and talk with you. Sometimes I sit to do interviews and I have no idea what's coming, but this has been a yeah, real pleasure, and and hopefully the the first and not the last. Is there anything else you want to leave our listeners and viewers with before we part ways? Well, I just want to just say thanks for listening, and and um, hope to catch you at the show. Come and say hi. Yeah.